welcome to um, the webinar, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Victoria Crystal. I am a geologist and a paleontologist. And so I use R a lot for some of my big data sets. Um, I do a lot of geochemistry. And so I have some pretty big data sets um, that have a lot of geochemistry numbers associated with them. Um, and so I use R as my primary tool for analyzing and producing visualizations, so graphs and charts and plots of all of that data. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna to go ahead and start sharing my screen. I'm gonna switch back and forth between PowerPoint and then actually going into R and writing code and working on all of that. So we're gonna bounce back and forth a little bit between PowerPoint and R. Um, so please let me know if I'm going too fast or if you have any questions. Um, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat and on the Q&A, um, but I think the chat would be best. So if you have any questions, um, just feel free to put it in the chat. All right, so we'll go ahead and start with our presentation here. So like I said, I'm gonna be talking about data visualization with R. I'll talk mostly about um, the data visualization capabilities of R, but I'm also gonna cover some of the other um, just basic statistical analyses and data manipulation. And if you don't know what I'm talking about yet, don't worry, I'll explain it all. All right, so here's a little roadmap of what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna start off pretty easy, just you know, covering the basics, what's R? And I also use R Studio with R, so I'll talk about what that is as well. Then we'll get into the interface of both of those two programs. Then we'll get into the basics of R code and how you start writing code. Then we'll get into loading packages um, and what that means to add on to the, the capabilities that are already built into R. Then we'll get into some simple statistical analyses with R. And then we'll get into the, the meat of it, the data visualization with graphs, charts, and plots. And then finally, we're gonna do a real world example of how R can be used to model things. Um, and we're gonna talk about flattening the COVID-19 curve using R. And then my last couple of slides in here is just some resources that I used um, in putting together this presentation and resources that I've used as I've been learning R. Um, so those are really great resources, some cheat sheets about the syntax and the coding and all of that. Um, and you'll get a PDF that has everything we do today, including PowerPoint slides and the R markdown file that we put together. Um, so you'll get all of this information. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. What is R? Um, R is a programming language and an open source software. So it's completely free, um, totally open for anyone to download. If you haven't already downloaded it, there are links to downloading R in the, um, the description of this class on, or this webinar on DoSpace's website. And primarily R is used for data manipulation, statistical analysis, and graphical display. And we're gonna talk about all of those things today. The data manipulation side of things is particularly useful for big data sets. R can process really big data sets like that. Um, just commands, simple commands that will do whatever you need with a big data set. Whereas in Excel, once you start having pretty significant size data sets where you're taking up a couple thousand, uh, ooh, is that a question coming in, something in the chat? Um, let's see. Oh, no, okay. Um, oops. Uh, so in Excel, if you have hundreds of thousands of cells worth of data, it really slows down Excel. But in um, R, it, there's no change. There's no uh, program that, or excuse me, there's nothing that's slower in programming things for large data sets, which is fantastic. People typically say that R is used most often for statistical analyses. That's kind of what you'll hear. Oh, R is a statistical programming uh, language, but it actually does way more than that. And one of the things, like I said, we're gonna talk about the meat of it today is the graphical display. There are really, really, really amazing graphs that R can make. So real quick, I'm gonna to go to this link here, um, which I have loaded right there. So R can do, oh, let me go back to the, the home page here that I wanted to show you. Um, oh, one more, there we go. So the package that I use for making plots is called ggplot2, and we're gonna get into the specifics of how to use it. Um, but you can make so many different types of plots with ggplot. Here's just some examples. We've got some pretty basic scatter plots there, um, some more complex plots, um, lots of layers with annotations and colors. 
Uh, we've got some stem and leaf plots, some histograms, a lot of very intricate, complicated plots. And it's very, very easy to customize, change colors, change font, change everything with ggplot. And so we've got some nice, pretty plots down here. I'm gonna scroll down. Um, you can also make art using using R, which is absolutely amazing. Um, it's not something I've ever done, but you can make very intricate um, artistic pieces using R. You can also create animated plots. Um, so we'll just click on this one, for example, here. And as you can see here, we've got our plot that's animated to show the progression of time. So you can actually animate your data to show that um, that time component there. There's so many amazing things. We're not gonna explore that website too much because I wanna show you how to make all of these things, not just that you can make them. So we'll go back to our slideshow here. The other great thing about R is that it's extendable. Um, so you can develop and add more and more packages to R. There's a lot of capabilities and a lot of commands that are already written into R, but it's really, really easy to add more and make very, very specific packages. So as a paleontologist, I use a specific package that's geared towards doing um, statistical analyses using paleo data. And so instead of you know writing out all of these equations every time I want to run some code, um, someone else put together a package that just runs all of that with a command of four letters. So it's really amazing the things you can do. And people make some just for fun. Um, like there's one that someone made that uh, will give you a random fortune. It's called like a fortune cookie package or something. So there's a lot of things it can do. You can also program it to send you a text message or to send emails. So if somewhere in your code you need to send the results of some analysis to your boss or someone else, a colleague, you can program it to do that automatically. It's really amazing. Um, the other thing is that it's easily integrated with C or C++ and Fortran, which is not something that I use it for, but I know that some of my colleagues do, and it's absolutely incredible that R just um, will easily integrate with it. And then finally, with R, you get a, a nice document output, especially with R Studio, which I'm going to show you um, how to use in a little bit. You can get all of your code and all of your syntax, everything that you've done um, combined all into one document, and it's very, very easy. It's all there. I'll show you a little bit more about that in the next couple slides. So what is our studio? I know I've mentioned it a couple times, but here we actually will get to where we figure it out. So it's an integrated development environment for R. Um, I basically think of it as a really nice dashboard to see everything in R. It has a really nice organized workspace, which you can see this is a screenshot of it um, with these four different windows, which I'll explain what those do in a couple slides. But you've got your console for writing all of your code and inputting all of your code, but it keeps everything very organized. So you see where your code goes and you can see where your um, R markdown file goes, which is what creates that nice document that I just mentioned. It's got some really nice syntax highlighting tools to prevent you from making kind of little typos and stuff. Or if you don't remember what the input goes into a code it'll it'll show you if you hover your mouse over it um, it's got really nice tools for exporting plots and files it's just a save command it's super easy and then it produces this r markdown document which is that document that has everything all together in html pdf um, or word document and then there's a r studio you can download it and use it on your desktop or you can just have it in your web browser and again there's a link for downloading r studio in the description for the webinar it's totally free before we jump into writing any of our code, I do want to give you a warning that there is a very steep learning curve to R. A lot of people, especially if they're unfamiliar with coding, if they've never coded in any other programming language before, have a really hard time with R. Um, I came to R having only ever worked in Excel, and I had a really hard time. Um, and so just you know, stick with it, you're going to get frustrated, but then you're going to get through it, you're going to get past that learning curve, and R is just an amazing tool that you can do so many things with. So bear through that frustration, and then you'll get there, and you'll have this amazing tool in your pocket. All right, so this is what the R interface looks like, and we're actually not going to do anything just in R. We're going to stay completely in R Studio because, as you can see here, this is just one console with everything there. Um, it's not very nicely organized, and it's a little bit confusing. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to stick here with R Studio, where we've got our four nice windows, and so everything is organized. It's not all jumbled together like in R. So this is um, this top right box or top right window, excuse me, is our R Markdown window. 
So like I said, our markdown is what controls our document. So it produces our well-organized document with all of the work, including code and the plots and the graphs, anything that you generate with that code. But you can also put um, any text or anything that you would put in a word processing document in your R markdown. So if you have a report to give uh, to your boss or something, or if you're a student and you have an assignment due or you have a write up with your data, and then you also have all of your data and your analysis and your plots that you're excuse me, that you're generating, um, you can put those all together. So our studio has all of the capabilities of a word processing program like Word. Um, it's very similar to LaTeX if anyone has used LaTeX. And so you can have it all together in that R markdown. Any text, anything you need to say about that document, as well as your code and any of the output um, from any of your code. So it's fantastic. This down here is the console window. Um, I don't really use the console window for much. This is just if you need to run code once, kind of a one and done sort of situation, it doesn't save it to be run again. Whereas anything in your R markdown, you can come back and run as many times as you want. So I typically just use the console window for anything I just need to do once. Like if there's a bug I need to fix or something I need to install, I do that in the console. This environment and history window is one of the really nice features about RStudio. It has all of your data sets and any variables or any vectors that you create inside R will all be displayed here. So it'll be really easy to find those. And I'll show you what that means. And then finally, we've got our viewer window. And so this can show any files that you have associated um, with your R project or any plots that pop up will come in this window. Um, it'll show you your library of packages and um, all of that. And I'll show you once we get into actually writing our code and creating our R markdown, I'll show you how all that works together. So with that, why don't we go ahead and open our studio. So here we go. I have everything that we're going to be doing today in the webinar um, up here in our uh, already loaded. So like I said, we've got our four windows. This is our R markdown space. This is our console. Um, you can kind of see the little bit of code that I was running just before this to produce um, the document that you'll be sent after this, this webinar to have all this information. We've got our environment up here and then this is our window. So all of these files are everything that I've put together in the same folder where I have this R markdown file. So I've got my slides and I've got some stuff for the COVID model, which we'll get to. So the first thing that you want to do when you open our studio will be file new project. I'm not going to click on it right now because that's going to confuse it since I have everything ready to go. And then once you've got your project saved either in a new folder or an existing folder and our studio will refer to folders as directories. So don't get confused if you see directory. Um, so once you've got your project all created, then you'll need to create an R markdown inside of that project. So the project is just um, uh, inside that folder you'll have your markdown and then you'll have any plots that you've created and of the project folder we'll just keep everything together so we'll do new file and then r markdown since that's what we'll be working in primarily here when you open a new r markdown it'll have some stuff preloaded in here that's just an example i usually just delete all of that except this little bit at the top that tells you what your output will be so i have it both as a pdf document and an html document um, just because that's kind of how I like to do it. So like I said, our markdown has all of the capabilities that you would have in a word processor, um, but you just have to give commands instead of clicking little buttons to make font size bigger, smaller, headings, things like that, just like you would in LaTeX. And so if you put a pound sign or a hashtag, as the kids are calling it these days, um, in front of words that you type, that means it's a heading. So that makes it a big heading at the top. And then if you put uh, two hashtags, it's a heading, but it's slightly smaller than the first, than the first um, heading. So this is like a main heading and then a subheading. And then any text that you want, you can just type as normal. And in the resources slide that I have in the um, PowerPoint that I'm doing is a nice little cheat sheet to all of these commands to make headings and change things, um, you know, center your text and all of that. Um, so within the R markdown, it'll recognize anything typed in the white space as just regular text that you're doing in your, in your um, kind of word processing document um, side of things. And then in order to tell R that the text you're typing is code or commands that you have that the program that R has to run, you insert a code chunk. So that's how we get this little gray box. It's called a code chunk. And you just go up here to insert, click it, and then we'll click R. But you can also uh, insert a chunk in all of these languages as well. But we'll stick with R since it's an R webinar. 
And the program will insert this gray box and the beginning and end of that gray box is denoted by these three little apostrophes at the top, which is basically telling R, okay, anything between these chunks of three apostrophes is code that we need to recognize as code. You know, the person programming it is telling us to do something with that. So we have to run that as a command. And then whatever is in the curly bracket is whatever language it's written in. So there's an R here because we're working in R. And usually what I like to do, you can add to that little curly bracket. I like to just say exactly what it is that we're, um, we're doing with that code. So if we're doing a title, you know, um, then I'll, if I come back to it days, weeks, years later, I can say, oh, in that code, you know, I put a title in here. Cool. So we'll go ahead and start writing some code. Um, R works very similar to um, other programming languages where um, you have to give a command and then you have to specify what to do that command to or what to do with it. And I'll show you more examples of what that means as we go on. Um, so this is our first code chunk, just doing some kind of simple stuff. Um, R will recognize basic arithmetic, so you don't have to input anything besides basic plus signs or um, the little asterisk to be a multiplication sign, um, the slash mark to be a division sign. So you can do basic arithmetic um, just as, as you normally would in a calculator, for example, in R. Um, and so if we were to run this, which I, I ran it this morning just to make sure there were no bugs in the code so we see the output here. Um, but we'll go ahead, I'll show you how to run things. So to run the code chunk, to basically execute all of these commands, you click this little uh, arrow or play button here on the right, and that will run the entire code chunk. And the output of that code chunk will just appear down here below it. Um, you can also have some options with uh, keyboard shortcuts. So on a Mac, you would hit Command, Shift, Return, or Enter. And then on a PC, you would just hit Control, Shift, Return. And that will run the entire code chunk. And then if you want to just run a portion of it, or if you want to run all the code chunks in an R markdown, you have some options up here in your run menu. Um, so right now we'll just do, let's just show what would happen if we just ran that selection. So to run a selection, you highlight it and then you just do command or control enter, and that will run just the highlighted part. So there we go, we've got our basic arithmetic, two plus three is five. So now we can get into some more complicated, um, but, but still very basic commands. Um, square root, so just like a calculator, you know, you can do a square root, and the command for square root in R is just SQRT, and then parentheses, and inside the parentheses, you have to tell R what to take the square root of. So as you notice, when I'm hovering my little cursor above that command, a little yellow box appears that says the command and then parentheses X. And so that will show up to remind you what the command is and then what inputs are needed. So if we were to run just that, there is our answer for. And here we're getting another uh, really useful command is round. So let's say you've got a really big, um, let's get the little yellow thing. There we go. Um, so you've got a really you know long string of digits there and you just need to round it um, to a few. You can do round, and then within the parentheses, you do X, so the number that you want to round, and then you specify the number of digits. So in this case, digits equals three. And I'm just going to run this whole code chunk so we can see here. Um, so we've got different lines corresponding to the different lines of code. So there we've got pi rounded to just three digits there. Log is also a pretty basic function that R has written into it. So you can do R, uh, excuse me, you can do a log of a number. R defaults to uh, natural log, so base E, but you can also specify whatever base you want. And then you can also start nesting your commands. So as you can see within this round command, I'm taking the log of 34 base five, and I'm rounding that to, to three digits. And so when we run just that chunk, we get this answer down here. And then finally, R also has basic statistical functions like mean, uh, median, uh, mode, things like that built into it. And so if we want to give it a string of numbers to take the mean of, one important thing to remember is that we have to tell R to look at a string of numbers as a string of numbers together. Instead of just looking at these as discrete values, we need to tell it you're looking at this as a set of numbers or a string of numbers or a list of numbers. And to do that, we use this little C function, which stands for combine or concatenate. So basically we're just telling it, we're taking the mean of combine one, two, three, and four. And doing that, we get our result down here. 
All right, so now we're gonna pop back over here. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is creating objects or variables and vectors and data frames in R. Um, so one of the really nice capabilities of uh, programming languages like R is your ability to assign names um, or kind of shortcuts to individual objects or variables, as well as lists or vectors um, and data frames. So the first is an object or variable. Basically, you just give something a name. Um, so our example here is I'm giving, whoops, sorry, I'm giving one, the name object. So anytime I type object into R, once I've told it that object equals one, it's gonna know that I mean one every time I type object. And that's the same thing for a list um, or vectors. Um, basically, you just sign a list to, uh, excuse me, you sign a name to a list. So in the example, vector equals one, two, three, four. So then every time I type vector, it knows I mean one, two, three, four. And then finally, the same thing, we can do that um, with data sets or data frames. So if we have this table uh, with three columns and two rows, we can basically tell um, R that we're giving that table or that data set a name. So in this example, we've called this table data frame. So instead of having to create the table every time or copy paste it, we just type data frame and R knows that we're talking about this specific table. So we're gonna pop back over here into R and get into some examples. Um, so let's just do a really simple object. We're gonna call X two. And as we saw earlier within our code, we used the equal sign. So when we were telling R to run um, this code, when we round something to three digits, we would say digits equals three. And so instead of using equals again, we're gonna use this little uh, less than symbol and a hyphen. So like kind of a little arrow when we're naming things. So anytime you assign a name, you're gonna use that symbol. So that's just the uh, less than sign that's above the comma plus the, the hyphen. So we're gonna assign X the value of two. So I just ran that one line. And as you can see here up in our environment in our history window, we have values come up here. And then next to it, we can see um, that x is two. And so let's say we had x equals two, y equals seven, we would see all those pop up there in our window. And then if we wanna just uh, print what that value is, or we wanna see what that value is within our R, um, uh, R markdown, excuse me, we can just print x and then it runs just that and shows us what x is. So if we forget, oh, what's x, print it, there we go, x equals two. You can also make it a little bit more complicated. New object um, equals x times three. So we're using that value that we've created um, to create um, another value. So if we, I'm just gonna run the whole code chunk, but then new object, we can look over here equals six because x is two times three is six. Then here's an example with temperatures. We created a list. So again, we use that little C concatenate because we're combining uh, 57, 68, and uh, excuse me, 57, 60, and 85 to be a list called temperatures. And we can make lists um, that are either numeric or character. So here, I also created a list called weathers. So we've got um, the character, the characteristic of the weather, it's cloudy, it's sunny, it's rainy, and then we've got temperatures. Let's say we forget how long, you know, how many weather items do we have in this list? We can run just this command length and it'll tell us how many values we have. We have four, um, which is actually kind of jumping ahead a little bit because I ran the whole code, but you can also add to a list. So let's say you get the weather for another day and it's snowy. So you can just rename weathers again to be the original weathers and then add another, another item to it. So we've added snowy. And then let's say we forget which one was which. Was weathers the number and temperature the character or was it vice versa? So we can just run this command class to see, oh yeah, weathers was the character. We can also take means. Um, so we can do the mean of the temperatures list and we get this output here, 67. And then we can do our data frame. So what we're gonna do, R has some built-in data sets that we're gonna use for our first example. Um, and so the data set faithful is the um, eruption time of the geyser at Yellowstone. So the, the time that the geyser is uh, erupting and then the wait time between each eruption. And so we're just gonna save this 
um, we're going to call data this data set. So as we can see over here in our environment, we have the data set data pops up because I'm very creative with my naming. You can see you could name it anything you want. I just kind of, you know, was uncreative and said data. And there's our there's our data set. So once we click it over here, it will appear in this window. We've got our eruption time and then our waiting time. And then again, if we want to see it here in our R Markdown or have it print in our R Markdown export document, we can just type data and then we'll run that and there it is printed below. You can also type print if you want, or if you're just interested in the first couple lines, you can run head of data and that'll just give you the first six. So now this is where we start adding layers to what we're doing because we can't just take the mean of a data set, right? That does not make any sense. And R knows that. So if we try and take the mean of data, it's gonna tell us that it can't do that. And so in order to be able to find the mean of some of the pieces of the data set, other packages um, have been created to make that really simple. And so what we did here is just loaded some of the packages. So we're just going to talk about three packages, but there's a lot out there. We're going to talk about Dippler, Tidier, and Magritter packages. So to install them, you go up here to Tools, Install Packages, and then you'll type the name. It'll uh, give you a little um, drop-down menu. We don't have Dippler here because I've already installed it, but you would select it from that drop-down menu and hit Install and hit Cancel. And then you run this uh, command library, basically just saying access your library of packages, which is over here in history, and then load a package from here with, with the command library. You only have to install it once, and so you can also um, write the command for installing that down here in your console, because it'll run it and then you won't ever have to install it again. So we're just going to run the, co the code chunk to load all of those. And then we will start playing with those a little bit more to manipulate our data. So what we're going to do is we're going to save it as a data frame. So take it um, just from kind of these columns with the listing of the variables in it, but to a data frame that we can manipulate and pull sections out of. So anytime you use the commands from these three packages, you'd save it as a data frame. And so there we go, um, saving it as a data frame. I'm just going to run this whole thing for simplicity. So I'm not going back and forth between running and uh, scrolling down again. So once we've done that, we can take the mean of a column. And so all we have to do is specify the data that we're using and then the column um, with the little dollar sign, just like in Excel. Or we can take the mean of the data and then tell it that we're just taking the first column and that these are numeric values. And so that'll return some numbers. And if we scroll down to our, our export there, um, we've got the mean both ways. We can also take the minimum. So let's say we wanted to know the shortest waiting time. We can run this chunk, uh, excuse me, this line, and there we'd get 23. Or the maximum of the eruption time. Look down here, we've got 5.1. Or the median, we can take, um, we can run this command column means to get the mean of both columns. Uh, so we've got two values down there. Or we can do row means, and that is this chunk of data right here. Um, that gives us the mean of all the rows. Doesn't really make sense to do in this data set, but if you have a data set where you need to do that. A range data, so let's say we wanted to look at the data in order from shortest eruption to highest eruption, or excuse me, longest eruption, we can do this command arrange. We can also um, select just one column of that data. So here we're gonna run, uh, oh, I already ran the code. So we've got my eruptions, we're naming a new data set here. So my eruptions is select column from my data and the column we want is eruptions. And there we go, if we go to my eruptions up here, we would get just that first column. Then we've got filter. So let's say we wanted to only view eruptions that were, this is just an example, you can do it with any values, but greater than two. Um, then the, we can scroll down here and it would give us a list of all the eruptions that are greater than two. We can make new a new data set from that. So we're calling it my new data equals filter my data eruptions greater than two. We can rename columns using the command rename. So we're renaming inside of the my new data set. We're calling the eruptions column long eruptions instead now that we've re that now that we've selected out all of the eruptions that are greater than two minutes one thing to note is that r does not recognize 
spaces in things. So in all of your commands and any column titles or anything that you input, um, you need to, anything that you're calling a variable, basically, or an aspect of a data set, you have to either do a period or an underscore instead of a space. If you're putting a title for an axis, when I'll show you when we get to writing plots, you can have spaces in that. We can also create new columns. So here we are just creating a new column called total time, which is the eruptions column, uh, the value in eruptions column plus the value in the waiting column. And then we can mutate the data. Um, so mutate is when you add the column. So here we can mutate the data again by making a, a last column here. We've scrolled down, we've got our um, total wait time here. There's our new third column with eruption plus waiting time. You can do a long eruption. Uh, we can put some characters in there, yes or no. So if it's greater than two minutes, you can tell it to put a yes in this column. And if it's shorter than two minutes, you can tell it to put a no. So there's a lot of things that you can do manipulating your data with the Dippler, um, Tidier, and Magritter. So now we're gonna move on. Um, I'll show you another way to create a data set. So this, we're gonna just create um, a random sequence of numbers. So we're just gonna call this new data set, or excuse me, this new data frame, um, just gonna call it data frame. And then to make a data frame, you just use this command data underscore frame. And if you ever forget what the command is or what needs to go, what needs to be input into it, just hover over it with your cursor and it'll show up. You can also come down here and you can type in your console, um, you can do question mark and then uh, whatever the command is. So question mark data underscore frame and just click that and then it'll open up um, some links in the help window. Um, so then you can just click on this and you'll see more information about that code. So we're gonna create a data frame. Variable one is just gonna be a sequence from one to a thousand going up by two, two, four, six, eight, et cetera. And then variable two, we're just gonna do a simple, simple linear function, two times variable one plus three. So what we'll do is um, we'll run this whole code and then we'll plot our data frame. There it is. And then library, we're going to start graphing things kind of as running this whole code gave away there. Um, so we're going to use that ggplot2 package that I mentioned. So what you would do is go up here to tools, install, oops, not window, sorry. Um, we will go to, oops, didn't want that either. Um, I don't know what I did. Uh, oh, it was just my little screen sharing icon was hiding it. So you'll go to tools, install packages, just like we did last time. Um, I don't know if you've ever shared a screen on Zoom, but you get a little um, green thing at the top that says you're sharing screen that blocks the top of your toolbar. And then to create a plot, um, just like any other object that we're making, we name it plot. Um, so plot and then our little arrow sign plot is, and then you're going to use the command ggplot. And then within that, in the parentheses, you're telling it what you're plotting. So we're gonna plot our data frame data that we just generated from this random sequence up here. And then we need to tell it the aesthetics. So how does it look? Um, so the first couple things that you have to tell for how does the plot look is you have to tell it what X and Y are. So we're gonna do X equals variable one, our independent variable, and Y equals variable two. And since this is a linear function, let's make it a, a line plot. And so in that case, we'll add geom line. So geom, the command geom has a lot of different options. So geom underscore all of our options, line, point, bar, whatever we want, whatever type of plot we wanna make, a line plot, scatter plot, bar plot, all of these. And I'll show you examples of how to do this. And then you just print your plot in your code. So when we run this, there's our plot. So yay, we've made our very first plot. So now, why don't we um, scroll down a little bit here and we're gonna start doing um, some more, there we go. Um, we're gonna start doing some more plot manipulations and how we customize our plots and add titles and, and colors and annotations and all that fun stuff. So here is an example data set from some of my research on dinosaurs. 
So this I'm using as an example to show you how you can read in some data from an Excel file. So it's this really simple command called read.csv. And you just have to save your Excel file as a CSV file. So you go up, save as, and then for file type, you hit CSV. And then make sure that you save it in the same folder that you've created this R project in, because R can only pull from files that are in, well, I shouldn't say that. With this specific command, R can only pull from files that are in that folder. And then you just put the, the title of the, the file in quotes, so it knows it's text. And then we're just gonna run this code to read that and then print the data set. And so this is a data set of fossils. Um, so it's geochemistry data of fossils. So I measured the carbon and the oxygen in a bunch of different types of fossils. So animal tells you the, the animal that the fossil came from, fish, crocodile, um, snail, dinosaur. And then site is just the location. So I collected from six different fossil locations in the same area. Um, and so I've got all those in there. So there's our data set. So now let's build some plots. And again, as you can see, I've um, titled what each code chunk is. So we've got our nice little plot here that I've put a lot of example lines and annotations. So I'm gonna walk you through this code a little bit here. Um, so plot two, I've called it, ggplot. So that's just the command to make the plot. We're using our paleo data. X is carbon, Y is oxygen. We're gonna make it a scatter plot. Theme will change the background. There's a lot of different options. Theme underscore lots of different things. Here's an example, theme dark, theme classic. The other thing to note, if you wanna put text in your code chunks, but you don't want it to run as part of the code, just put that little hashtag in front of it. And that's basically telling R anything after this hashtag is not something to run with the code. And so that's why it's in green here. And then you can change the titles on the X and Y axis using this X lab or Y lab like label and then just put in quotes what you want the text to say. You can add a title to the plot saying GG title and then you can customize that using element text um, and then color size face so just like you would you know make it bold make it italic anything. You can add a horizontal line or a vertical line using geom h line or v line, and then you can specify line type and color. You can annotate, add text to your plots by saying annotate, um, and then just specify what you want to say, where on the coordinate grid you want to say it, um, and then what it is. You can add line segments um, or arrows in this case. Again, specify where it is. Um, and then you can say arrow, um, and then you can specify the length of that arrow. Um, and then theme will change anything, um, any kind of appearance of any item in here. So we're changing the theme of the x-axis text, and you can make it bold, you can change the color, you can change the angle that it's at. So that's these numbers down here, negative eight, negative six. Um, don't worry too much about these numbers. Um, I know it kind of seems weird saying, well, how can you have negative carbon? It's actually just comparing the amount of carbon and the amount of oxygen to other fossils. And so it's negative because it's less than those other fossils I was comparing it to. So let's get a little bit more complicated here. I'm just gonna take the same plot that we have and I'm gonna add another component. So let's say we wanna see the X and Y being carbon and oxygen, but we also wanna see where these fossils came from, from the six sites that I collected. So in that aesthetics up here, you can just add color equals site. And then factor is just specifying um, that it's, um, it's numeric, but you can't have site 1.2, you can't have site 1.3, it's discrete. Um, and so we run that code and there we go. We've got our same plot as before, but minus those annotations, um, just so we can see the data. And then here we've got site in different colors. And you can change those colors using this command over here, scale color manual. Um, and then R will recognize if you put red or blue in quotes. The other thing you can do um, is you can add other layers. So we've got our color is our factor, but then let's say we also want to see what the animal is. So here um, I've included animal being the shape of the data point. So if we look back here at our chart, the shape of the data point corresponds to, oh, here we can pop this out so we're not cutting off that. 
oh, we're still cutting off the top of that little legend. Um, and we could change the size of that too, or the position of the legend. Um, but the squares are the fish, the triangles are the dinosaurs, the circles are the crocodiles. And then over here, I just gave another quick example of using um, all of that data manipulation stuff. We went over mutate and I added a new column. Total was carbon plus oxygen. And then here I added size. So the size of the point, the data point, corresponds to the total. So the bigger the size, the larger the total in this plot here. And then what we can also do, in case this is a lot to have in one plot, we can spread it out. So let's say uh, we separate it by animal. So we want to see just the crocodile data, just the dinosaur data. We use this command facet grid. And then um, a little curly, um, the thing next to the one, um, I don't know what that's called, to tell it that we're separating it by animal. And so that's that, or we could do it by site or by total, whichever we wanted. And then this separates it out into different columns with crocodile, dinosaur, fish all next to each other. But if we wanted those stacked vertically with crocodile, then dinosaur, then fish, we would do this command facet wrap. And that would stack them in a column instead of in a row. I'm going a little bit quick because I do want to make sure that we've got some time for our COVID example here at the end. Um, Here's another type of plot, a bar plot. Um, and then we can see we've just got geom bar and you can change the color and customize as much as you want with R. As you can see, it's very easy to customize things. Then we've got our pie chart, if we wanted to do that. We've got our stem and leaf plot or our box plot. I know these have a lot of different names. And again, customize away. You don't need to keep that boring gray background. You can make it however you want. Um, we've got a density curve here. Um, you can do a histogram. Let me just quick change this and run that again. There we've got a histogram. So you can do a lot of different things. So we're going to get to our COVID model real quick, but let's switch back. I've got some more slides to show you. Error messages. It's not uncommon to get error messages, um, especially if you're typing every piece of code out one by one. Um, very, very common. So the first thing to do if you get an error message is check your syntax. Did you forget to close a parentheses? Did you make a typo? Happens to me all the time. Um, is something capitalized that's, whoops, capitalized that's supposed to be, or is it not capitalized when it's not supposed to, oh, I said that backwards. Is it, you know what I mean, not capitalized when it's supposed to be and vice versa. Are you missing any plus signs? Every time you add a layer to that code, every time you add a horizontal line or an arrow, make sure that you're putting a plus sign. So you're saying plot this, plus this, plus this. I forget to put plus signs in all the time. The next thing you can do if you know your syntax is great, check the inputs for, their, for your command. Is there something that you needed to specify that you didn't? For example, if we just did facet grid and we didn't tell it to separate it out by animal, you would get an error because it doesn't know, okay, I'm gridding it, but what variable am I gridding it by? So you need to input that. The other thing is just copy paste and Google the error message. Like I said before, R is open source, um, totally free. So there's a lot of R users. There is a ton of information on error messages in Google. Nine times out of 10, I Google, what does this error message mean? Copy paste, boom, it's the first thing up there. All right, so let's get into models. We're gonna talk about models here. Um, so what is a mathematical model? What is it that we mean when we're saying we're modeling something with R? So basically we're just using logic or math basically to organize situations, events, or processes into components and how those components are related to each other. So each component has its own set of parameters and its own inputs and outputs. So here's like a simplified little picture each of these boxes represents a component that has outputs that go um, to other components and it has inputs that, that uh, come from other components. Let's see why I can't, there we go. Um, so here's an ecosystem example that I'm gonna go through a little bit quickly, um, but as a geologist, I tend to teach about ancient ecosystems. Um, and so I do a lot of things like this, modeling um, uh, food, food chains basically, so plants, that have inputs from the sun and from the atmosphere and from the soil, then those plants are then outputs to herbivores, which eat them, and carnivores, which eat the herbivores. 
And then those have inputs from the atmosphere when they breathe and things like that. Um, and then when those die, detritivores or decomposers will eat those. Um, so here's just an, an ecosystem example. But now why don't we get into our, our COVID example? So we have seven different components that we're going to be modeling in our COVID simulation. So S, so in this model, um, compartment is the same as um, component. So S is susceptible individuals, so people who can get sick. E is exposed and infected, not yet symptomatic, but potentially infectious. So someone who's been exposed to someone with the virus, they have the virus, but they don't know they're sick yet. They're asymptomatic, they don't, they're not sneezing or coughing, or I guess sneezing's not associated, but they're not coughing, they don't feel ill, but they could potentially infect other people. Then we've got I, which is infected, symptomatic and infectious, people who are sick and know they're sick. Q is quarantined, so people who are infectious, they, are no, they know they're sick, they can get others sick, but they're staying home. They're not going to work, they're not going to school, they're staying home. H is requiring, oh, sorry, I keep clicking. H is requiring hospitalization. People need to go to the hospital. R is recovered. People who were sick and they're better, immune to further infection. In this model, they're immune to further infection. Um, from what I've read recently, we don't know that that's 100% true. And then finally, the F component is a case fatality, someone who passed away due to COVID. Um, and then this is how all of those are related. So we'll go through this real quick. Someone's susceptible, um, so they can get sick and then become exposed and infected and they don't know they're sick yet. So they're asymptomatic, but they could still infect others. Um, and you know, those infected people can expose and infect those susceptible people. They can become infected and infectious. Again, they can infect others or they can quarantine. Um, they can stay home and self-isolate, or they can go to the hospital, or they can go from staying home to needing the hospital, or they can go straight to recovered. If someone needs hospital, um, they can either pass away, or they can recover um, and not be sick anymore. So that's our model. And again, this will be available. I went through it really quickly, but this will be available for you to take a look at. Um, so why don't we get into our model here? Um, so just want to point out, this is a model from Tim Church's Health Science Data blog. So you can visit his blog and get more information about this model. It uses a package called EpiModel that models um, how a virus moves through a population. And that was developed at Emory University. And so what we're going to do is we're going to model the transmission of COVID-19 through a population of 10,000 using this package that has equations input with how a virus actually infects other people. And this model is completely based on epidemiology theory about how viruses move through a population. None of this is real data. So none of what we're looking at is actually real data of anyone who's been sick or anything like that. Not real. Um, just based on theory of how viruses work. So the first thing that we're going to do here is load all the packages that are required to run this model. It's a pretty complicated model, so there's a lot of packages and some other files associated with it. Um, so I, I've preloaded that. And then this is a code that basically puts all of these components together, the inputs and outputs and everything, and um, we'll make our model. We'll generate um, all of our curves. So this is going to show first how a virus is moving through a population of 10,000 people. And there's a lot of stuff going on here. We're not going to go line by line. We don't have time for that. But we're just going to take a look at two factors here. Um, so this actual rate of um, uh, this is the actual rate of infection. This is the only thing that's based on real numbers. Um, this 2.5. This is how uh, infectious the virus is. So one person who has it can infect 2.5 people if they go about their daily basis um, of, uh, you know, going out into the world, going to work, going to school, all of that. So one person infects 2.5 people. That's based on, on real data from observing the virus. That's the only piece of real data. And then this quarantine rate here. Um, we're going to focus on this because we'll be able to change this. But right now we're putting it at one in 30 people who have the virus and they know that they have the virus, they know they're sick. Um, one in 30 of those people that, are, that know they're sick stays home from work. 
or stays home from school. So that's the quarantine rate. So one in 30 people quarantine themselves so they don't go out in the world and get anyone else sick. So I previously ran this very, very long code chunk that just sets up all the parameters. Um, and then this is just kind of what the, the raw numbers that the simulation spits out. Um, but we're going to plot it using our uh, ggplot commands that we just talked about. So hopefully you see some familiar commands here. So let's take a look. Here's what we've got. Um, so we've got our different curves that are color coded for the different um, components that we talked about. Um, so the bottom, the x-axis here, is the days since the beginning of the epidemic. So day zero to 100 days after the virus got to this community of 10,000 people. And then the y-axis here is the number of people. Um, so prevalence, how many people. And so what immediately we notice here, what we take note of, is we have this huge red curve. And red is those infected and infectious people. So the people that are sick and know they're sick. This second huge curve here is the orange curve. So that's the infected people who are asymptomatic. They don't know they're sick. So they are continuing to go to work and go to school and all that. And then here, this blue curve, we've got our self-isolation, our quarantine. So anyone who is sick and knows they're sick and stays home. So that's our one in 30. And that's one in 30 starting on day 15 of this pandemic. Um, so 15 days in, it's on the news, people are getting sick, people are getting sick. So after 15 days in our simulation, people start staying home when they realize they're sick. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna change that. So we're gonna change that rate of people who are sick and know they're sick, staying home. We're gonna change it from one in 30 people to one in two people who are sick and know that they're sick, staying home. So this code is just uh, running that same model with the higher self-isolation rate. And so here's what we get. We've got our baseline, so the same thing that we were just looking at up top, just to compare. And then we've got our ramp up of isolation. So as you can see, our blue line one in two people now are staying home. And so this is what it means when they say we're gonna flatten the curve. We took that big red curve of the rate of people getting sick, um, excuse me, not the rate, the amount of people that are sick, that are infected and know they're sick, and we flattened that. We made it shrink way down just by having one in two people stay home from work or school when they know they're sick instead of one in 30 people. So we did a pretty good job there. We really reduced that red curve. But we still have, you know, this orange curve. And that's not good, right? We don't want people getting sick or dying. So that's our infected and they don't know they're sick yet, um, but they can still get other people sick. They're asymptomatic. So why don't we see what we can do to reduce this orange curve to the height of that red curve? So in this next scenario, we're going to add a component of um, social distancing. So people who aren't sick um, or people who you know, aren't asymptomatic and don't know they're sick yet, but just everyone in the population staying home, everyone working from home, everyone staying home from school. And we're gonna see how that can contribute to flattening this orange curve. So that's the code to run that. And here we go, we've got our, um, we're just gonna open this in a new window so we can see it all we've got the results. So up top here is our very first uh, model that we ran. This one's the second one where we changed the rate of people staying home and quarantining to one in two instead of one in 30. Here, what we've done is we've dropped that quarantine rate back down as if only one in 30 people are staying home, but we've included social distancing. So starting at day 15, everyone has been staying home. Um, you know, people, everyone's working from home and all of that. And so as you can see here, we, you know, did, oops, sorry, we did reduce that a little bit, um, but that's not as effective as if we were to take a, um, a slightly different approach and to quarantining and social distancing. So why don't we test out, what if we started social distancing at day 30 instead of day 15? So this one here, sorry, I think I forgot to say that. Um, 15 days into the pandemic, people who are healthy start staying home from work. Um, so that contributes to reducing these curves from being up here. 
And then let's say, nah, let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. Um, you know, we don't need to stay home. There aren't very many people that are sick. And so in this scenario here, people didn't start staying home until day 30. And so as you can see here, when people held off on social distancing and staying home, we still have some pretty significant numbers of people getting sick. And so that's why you may have heard on the news that it takes two weeks to figure out if social distancing is working, um, because we're not going to see the effect of everyone staying home until after we've had a chance to stop all of those cases. So you don't see the results instantly because it does take um, about a week to, to two weeks for people to develop symptoms of the virus. And so if we hold off, we still get this big spike here because people were getting sick and then um, starting two weeks later, or sorry, people were not social distancing, they were intermingling, they were getting the virus, and then starting two weeks later, they're really seeing those symptoms and becoming infected. So that's why waiting until 30 days to social distance does not help in this situation. And then this last one, this is what we want to model. We've significantly reduced the infected and infectious curve, that red one, and we've significantly reduced the um, infected and asymptomatic, they don't know they're sick yet curve. And in this scenario, we increased our social, um, excuse me, we increased our quarantining of our infected and infectious people back up to one in two, just like we noticed up here, one in two people stay home when they're sick and they know they're sick. But on day 15, we also had the whole population staying home and social distancing. And so as we can see when we've got people quarantining when they're sick and people working from home or not going to school, we really reduce the number of cases. And so that's what a lot of the governments were basing um, some of their protocols and their policies on is taking a lot of these different models from doing nothing to changing the quarantine rate to changing when we start instituting stay at home and social distancing rules and they look at these models and they try and figure out okay what combination of these things will give us the most significant reducing or flattening of the number of people getting sick and so that's where a lot of these ideas um, with social distancing and everything have come from is just doing iteration of model after iteration of model, trying to figure out what's, what prevents the most people from getting sick. Because that's what we want to do. We want to protect the population. We don't want people to get sick and we don't want people to die. Um, so there's our COVID example and we are just about out of time here. One more thing I want to show you. Once we've finished our, our um, whole R markdown, we have our report written, we've got our code, we've got all of our um, plots generated. The way to generate that PDF or that HTML is to hit knit up here. And that's basically just telling it knit this all together into our output. Click the drop down arrow and then do HTML, PDF or Word, whichever one you want to pick. And so I have knitted this whole thing. And then down here, I also uploaded all of my slides. So uh, I will have um, do space send out this um, completely knit PDF with all of the code, all of the plots, and also all of the slides. And then to pop back over into slides real quick, here's the resources, um, some really, really useful resources, a, a link to Tim's blog where we've got this COVID model, um, and then some references um, that I used when I was writing some of the code for this, this webinar. So with that, I'm gonna stop screen sharing go back to so you can see me um, and please 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 post questions in the chat oh good looks like they've got the link to the pdf and the slides in the chat there so that's that's there for you um, does anyone have any questions i know i went through that pretty quickly also so if you don't have time to stick around and ask questions my email address is on that first slide so feel free to shoot me an email and ask me questions as well Ooh, good question. How long did it take for you to feel comfortable using R? Um, I would say it probably took like about a month of like pretty heavy R use um, where I was going in on, on kind of a, a maybe, maybe I should shorten that, a couple weeks it, when I was going in on a daily basis um, and using R. One of the things that's really, really nice about R being open source is that there's a lot of code available online. And so a lot of my learning 
how to, to do R was looking at those resources that I have on the resources slide and looking for commands that would do things that I needed. And then I would just Google, you know, how do I add an arrow to a plot? And then instantly in Google, usually the first result would have the code and I would just copy paste it into my, into my R markdown. Um, and that's really how I learned a lot of things just by going into Google when I needed to know how to do something and searching for it um, and having, you know, using someone else's skills and knowledge who are way better than me um, and learning from them instead of recreating the wheel myself. Um, we call that copy paste coding. Um, and so I would say it was like a week or two of like, you know, really doing that a lot and figuring out. And then once you start doing that, you kind of get a sense of like, you know, in their code, they, you know, input these different commands to get this result. And so the next time you know what you need to input to get that result or to get a similar result. Um, so it does definitely take some dedicated time. I think it also just depends on how comfortable you are with coding and, and kind of computer linguistics in general. Um, when I first started using R, like I, you know, the most complicated thing I ever did in Excel was like, you know, equals sum of highlight six columns and hit enter. So I didn't know anything really about coding. I'd never really written a macro in Excel. Um, and so I think if you've, done a little bit more with computer stuff than I had before, it'll go a little bit faster too. Um, but the internet is so fantastic with R. Um, and there's forums too, like you can post, I'm trying to do, you know, make a plot of, you know, whatever your data is, and you can post an example um, or a picture of what you want and people will help you out with that. There's so many resources online. Um, so, kind of depends on, on your own learning um, and what you're trying to do. But um, yeah, I, I hope that, I hope that answered your question. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> and feel free to reach out to me too. I, I, I don't even consider myself an expert in R. Um, I've been using it for a couple of years and I still have so much to learn. So I'll frequently send out, uh, you know, an email to a friend of mine who's way better at R and be like, hey, I'm trying to write this code. I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. Um, so definitely like rely on resources and people that you know too. Um, sometimes it's easier just to have someone say, oh, you need to input, you know, the color you want the text or something. So feel free to send an email too. And you can do some pretty fun things in R too. Like when I was working on um, my master's thesis, I was just really wrestling with a data set um, that was kind of similar to the one that I used for the examples. And I just couldn't figure anything out. And so one day I just like took all my code and put little hashtags in front of all of it and then changed one of my plots to just say like, you can do it, you know, you'll get your thesis done or something. And so whenever I generated that code, I just saw like this kind of positive message, uh, which was really nice to do where when I was frustrated and working on a thesis, it was a little boring and not so fun at that point. I was a little frustrated with it. So it was nice to be able to just play around with R and make a plot that just had a nice positive message. And like I said, you know, it's kind of overwhelming at first, especially if you've never coded anything before. Um, so, you know, if you think of a question later on, my email address is there. There's also a lot of packages that are written um, for very specific things. And so it always helps to Google it. Um, oh, we have a question. This might be silly. Does R Studio work without downloading R? Do you have to? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you do have to have both. Um, you don't ever have to have R open with R Studio. R Studio will will open and run everything just fine. Um, but you do have to have R also downloaded. Um, R Studio pulls on a lot of the um, information that's that's written into R in order to be able to run the code. Um, so R Studio can't interpret the coding language on its own. Um, so you do have to have R downloaded, but um, uh, you don't have to have R open.
so that's actually a really good question um, that sometimes is really confusing for a lot of people. I had a one of my um, my colleagues in grad school who is also a grad student with me was having such a hard time because our studio just wasn't working and wasn't working and it was because she didn't have R downloaded. Um, and so yeah, that is actually a really common issue, a really good question to ask. I'll stick around for just a couple more minutes in case you're still processing and, and taking in all of this and think of a question. It's a lot. It, it is a lot to to take in. I tried to cover a lot of information in the webinar, but also hopefully you still were able to grasp it. Okay, well, it doesn't seem like there's any more questions, um, but if you think of any, feel free to just shoot me an email. Um, I'm happy to help. So thank you everyone so much for being here and for listening. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, have a good rest of your evening.